Le cheval plaît beaucoup, hein. c'est un vecteur de communication extraordinaire. Avant d'être un cavalier, c'était important d'être un, un horseman. Always put the horse before the personal ambitions. Vraiment un cheval incroyable. Voilà quelqu'un qui est champion olympique et qui n'est pas ordinaire. Ça en met en question et peut se servir des défaites pour être meilleur après. Ce feeling, je l'ai eu directement avec Kellogg. On fait du haut niveau, il y a le côté financier, c'est comme ça. Aller en compétition parce qu'il est bon, pas parce qu'il paye une table. Moi, je veux pas courir mes chevaux pour l'argent. If you can do it in a way that doesn't take too much out of your horses. Quand on voit l'évolution en, en 10 ans de temps, qu'est-ce que ça va être dans 10 ans Pouvoir motiver les jeunes à aller au bout de leurs rêves. Forme de très très bon compétiteur, je ne vais pas dire que ça forme des hommes de chevaux. Pour moi, les bons moments, ils sont à venir. Aujourd'hui, réussir sa vie, c'est avoir la vie que l'on souhaite. So, we've been thinking about our 100th episode for months now. But as you can imagine, picking the right guest was not an easy choice. After recording episodes with legendary writers, such as Nelson and Rodrigo Pessoa, Eric Navet and Pierre Durand, world number ones and multi-medalists, such as Peter Fredrickson and his teammate, Henrik von Eckermann, young talents, members of federations, how could we still innovate and bring to this medium a sense of freshness, something to shake up what has already been done and what we have already offered in our 99 previous episodes? Of course, the list of people we'd love to record is still long. There are many riders, horsemen and horsewomen, who have brought a significant contribution to our sport and who will have a lot to say. Here is a non-exhaustive list. Steve Gerda, Luciana Dinis, Edwina Tops Alexander and Jan Tops, Stefan Conter, Marcus Henning, Jessica Van Bredo, Nicola and Thierry Touzain, Philippe Gerda, Thierry Lermit, Guillaume Kenney, John Ellen Tim Price, Ben Mayer, Luca Moneta. For this 100th episode, we wanted to speak the truth, to speak without a filter, to free our conversation from all the constraints and limits of political correctness, of everything that cannot be said or revealed. In a previous newsletter, we spoke about the difficulty we have in taking a stand and engaging in uncomfortable conversations. I'm an equestrian is not a whistleblower, nor is it intended to be, but we do have a growing desire to move the lines and open the way to asking the hard questions. That is the exact reason why we choose to talk to Noel Floyd. If you do not know Noel, then let us introduce her briefly. Noelle is a Canadian show jumper. Like us, she has long dreamed of turning professional. Her ambition and determination brought her all the way to Europe to live this dream, and she joined a competition stable as a rider. Discovering the European system, its competition, its athletes, and its singularities, she decided to share her vision and experience in a blog. Eleven years later, noelfloyd.com has taken a new turn and gradually transformed into a platform offering masterclasses for amateur riders. This evolution is nothing less than the concretization of her personal development. Noel Floyd has the honesty and courage to look at the sport as it is, to question it and to help it evolve. With Noel, we talked about uncomfortable topics, our duty to tell the sport story, the urgent need to change our beliefs and practices and about the most likely future of our sport. We hope that this episode will be as powerful and impactful to you as it was for us. Thanks again to Noel for our time. I am Anneke's friend isn't stopping here and we can't wait to tell you the next 100 stories. Um, Noel, thank you very much for recording this episode with us. This is actually the first time since 2020 and COVID that we're re recording remotely, but um, we kind of had to be able to talk to you at some point. Um, <laughs> since we launched our podcast, uh, it was uh, three, four years ago, your name has been on our guest wish list, you know, and we have to say that we are thrilled to get to virtually meet you today. We have a huge agenda for this conversation, so there are many topics we want to talk with you. But first, um, I'm going to take a couple of minutes to introduce you. Okay. When writing this 
introduction down, I initially started with your entrepreneurial life, but um, I'd like to introduce the equestrian you first. So you're Canadian and you are, may I say, a former show jumping rider. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So you competed as an amateur first and then got to work as a home rider in Belgium. You know the industry, you know this world up to the smallest corner. In 2012, you launched a blog, noelfloyd.com, and for years, you wrote stories and articles about the whole sport. You shared um, plenty of pictures, news, thoughts. Um, 11 years later, now, this blog has grown and uh, become a multidimensional multimedia company whose name is still yours, Noel Floyd. So you are the CEO of this company. So Noel Floyd, the CEO, Noel Floyd, the equestrian, which one is predominant today? I would say the, the over the last 10 years, for sure, the CEO. But I think very recently I've started to make some space in my life to be an equestrian again, which I'm really happy about. Do you still feel like you're an equestrian before all? Always. I mean, I think I actually said this in a in in another podcast. It became really clear to me a couple of years ago when I was doing other sports or exploring other hobbies that I still will always identify as as a rider. Um, it's sort of imprinted into like my very DNA. I think it's just how I how I see the world or how I identify in the world. And I don't think any time away from personally riding would ever change that. So, Noel, nice to meet you first. Nice and to meet you. Uh, uh, like Lorelai said, uh, we would like to talk about you before we talk about noelfloyd.com and company. So, Noel, what was your life before 2012? What kind of kid and teenage life did you have? I was... You're a typical horse crazy girl. I rode, I had a, I had really fortunate opportunities to be able to ride and compete both in Canada and the United States growing up. Um, my family was not like a super well-to-do family with the ability to put me into the top sport really early on. So I rode for a lot of different trainers and I I uh, rode a lot of different horses. I caught, I catch ride a lot or caught, I, we say catch riding in English. I don't know what the word is in French, but, um, so I had a really variable experience. I rode all through university as well. And I rode in New Zealand and that was an amazing experience. I got to see a completely different side of, of show jumping and young horse development. I, I spent a lot of time, Before the age of 25, I did a lot of young horse development, which I really appreciated. So my, I mean, and that's where I think the success of the brand has been a reflection of my own experience. I think my experience is very similar to many people's experiences. And I just chose to um, infuse that into all the work that we do. What kind of equestrian were you back then in 2012 when you created the blog? What were your, you know, um, needs, your um, wishes, your concerns about your sport? It's interesting. I, I, I thought I wanted to be a professional. I really like had this ambition um, to get into the professional side of things. And when I became a professional and I was a low level professional, But when I when I actually changed the way that I existed with horses, I actually was really unhappy. I didn't enjoy that transactional relationship with horses at all. Um, and so it was evident pretty early on in exploring the different facets of the sport. You know, you can be an amateur, you can be a professional, you can be a working student, you can you can mentor under a professional, you can. Um, you know, you can, you can be an amateur owner, you can, you know, all, there's so many different ways in which you can exist and ride. I actually thought just from the way that we idolize professionals and we idolize that life, I thought that that would be absolutely what I wanted for myself and that I would work my, the work, the hardest that I possibly could to pursue that. Um, and then when I started to be able to actually make visible steps towards that, Um, goal 
I recognized very early on that that was actually not, I was in love with the idea of being a professional and I think I romanticized it. As soon as I had a transactional relationship with horses and it was very, um, and again, I'm not saying this is everyone's experience, it was just my experience, um, that business, inserting the business into the relationship with horses was like, for lack of a better word, like awful. I hated it. I thought it was like, I thought, why would I do that? <laughs> so, um, my needs early on, I would say shifted quite quickly when I realized that like the love and the passion that I have for horses could look and feel differently. If I opened my mind up to just how I would, how I could contribute to the horse industry. I think it was pretty early on in my twenties where I knew that I wanted to make my mark in the horse world. Like I wanted to contribute to it in some way. Um, and so it, that, but that evolved between, you know, 20 and 25, 26. So Noel, who are you now? How much and how far have you developed? Are you still the passionate rider you used to be? Are you still deeply involved and in admiring of the horse sports? Well, I mean, I've evolved a lot. I've spent time working on myself. I mean, we all, I mean, I think we, I think COVID changed, um, shifted a lot for everyone in terms of priorities. And um, so I'm not like any, unlike anyone else in that way. Um, I am as passionate, if not more passionate. I think I'm just less self-conscious about how nerdy I am about being a horse girl. Like I care less about what people think. And I have, I've always had a bit of this rebellious side to my nature. And I, I struggled in having that constitution and trying to like fit in, in the horse world. And I think now that I'm 36, I don't really desire to fit in. I desire to speak my truth and to be empowered into my own journey and empower other people. Because I think the individuality that exists in the horse world is what makes us like this beautiful rainbow of people. Um, and I'm not interested in like believing that one way is the best way. I think as I get older, I respect more like the gray and recognizing Everyone has a different experience. One way, or, one way is not the right way. And that's, I think, a really beautiful evolution. And that reflects the horse world as a whole, right? That we're becoming less black and white, that we're understanding that there's nuances in terms of like the horse-human relationship, the horse-human interaction, how sport exists, what our responsibility is to horses, both in the sports space and in the non-sport space. And I'm just happy to see that I think And I don't think it's a reflection of me. I think it's a reflection of the collective that people are having more open conversations about things that they're uncomfortable about, things that they're not, you know, things that they don't personally want to accept in their own journey with their horses. I think people just have more of a voice, individual voice than they've ever had, which is really. And I think I'm just a reflection. I feel I have more of an individual voice than I've ever had. If we focus on sport, it has dramatically swift um, toward a new era. Um, everything got more structured, more professional. There are more sponsors, maybe more investors also, much more shows over the world and uh, overall more people competing, at least here in Europe. There are a lot of shows, a lot of mm -hmm. um, stables, you know, much more than before. And money now plays a bigger role. Um, new leagues have emerged with higher price money for the riders and everything. You know all that, I'm sure. Yes. Have you been able to observe all these changes? And um, what's your vision about the current situation of sports? If we really focus on high-level sports, you know? I think that what I... I like to see that there is more... I love to see more variety in the top sport. So I love when we see different forms of horsemanship, different approaches, professionals like Henrik von Eckermann winning worlds with barefoot. I love that there's like a more, there's more of an open-minded approach to what is best for horses at the top sport. And I love that there's more attention to that than ever. I think it's a mistake 
that we try to be anything else but ourselves. I think when the sport tries to fit into a box that external bodies or the IOC or, you know, when we try to, when we try to fit into a mold so that we are more what we were perceived as more appealing or we're perceived as more palpable to the general public. I question whether that is like really in the best interests of the sport or the community as a whole, because we are super unique. You can't compare us to formula one. You can't compare us to golf. Like, we're a completely unique sport in that way because we're not, we're an individual sport and in that there's an individual human athlete, but it's a team sport because, you know, there's a, the horse human connection is what makes us so fundamentally unique and we stand out from any other sport in that way. So I think speaking generally, I, all I believe is I hope that the powers that be and the governing bodies feel that that uniqueness is is something to be to be cherished that's something to be preserved i think the more we get focused on the sport the more i see the focus on the rider which i think is a mistake i think the horse is what makes us truly what's the word the horse is what makes us like timeless as a sport and I think if we continue to root ourselves in that distinguishing feature, and then I think that we have the opportunity to evolve into something better than we've even ever been as a community. But I think when we try to be some other sports and we try to draw too much inspiration from outside of ourselves, when it comes to format or when it comes to even sports promotion, I think is more than ever. Like when I see competitions promoted like Formula One, like we're not Formula One. Our horses are not, our horses are not, not cars. You know, they don't deserve that kind of fast paced, like cheap, quick coverage. Like we deserve to have the, it, I, we deserve to be different. And I think that's what makes us unique. And I think that's what I would love to see that people at the at the top of the sport that are governing it to have that vision and to have that strength and character to stand up and say we're not those other sports we're we're something different we offer something completely different media also have a responsibility in the evolution of sport in the way the public thinks about our sport and in what's known what's hidden what should be known etc about mm -hmm. the sport about the top sport um but you know that This is hard. And um, I know that just like us, you have faced the question multiple times. What can we share? What are the limits? How can we release a podcast or an article or a post about that when we know that it will most certainly displease the whole industry? And all of these questions must be addressed very carefully because as a media, we also need people. That's the truth. We need people to keep trusting us, to keep being willing to come speak on our podcast to accept our invitation to keep opening the doors of yeah. their bound to us so how do you keep the balance you know between what you want to tell about the industry what you want to show and what can be shown and what can be told i don't think my my team are, and i have ever tried too much to have a layered filter. I think my belief is that media is a reflection of where the community or the collective is in its current present moment. And our job is just to be a mirror. So our responsibility is to mirror back where a community or a sport or a collective is at. That's our job. And we either do that well or we don't do that well because we either have the strength of character to, because not everyone wants to see their reflection, right? And so, and I think that's truth of not just within the horse sport, but within the world at large. I think when media is doing their job, they're reflecting and they're mirroring back what is true and present in this very moment. Now that might cause upset and that might cause 
lots of emotions in people because they may or may not like to see what they, you know, they may not like what they see. I think it's our job to be a mirror. I think that's what all media and that's the, you know, I, we don't, we don't cover the sport the way that we used to. We've moved into production. Um, and that's the feature of our platform for sure is multimedia production. Um, but I would always suggest that that media is not promotion, that media is reflection. I think it's an important distinction. So you think we're not here to share only success stories, but also to reflect what really happens? Absolutely. That's the fundamental backbone of journalism. So let's talk about noelfloyd.com, uh, your <laughs> company. This mm -hmm. is really a success story. And as far as we are concerned, it is deeply inspiring. Mm -hmm. What was the, the purpose of this initiative at first? It was, it was, just, it was truthfully to storytell in my way. There was around the time that I started the blog was around the time that blogs were kind of surfacing in different facets of the world. I was in Europe and I was competing and I remember noticing that like coverage in Europe was very focused on the European audience and in North America, it was very focused on the American audience and there was no one bridging the gap. And I thought, well, that's, you know, I just remember thinking, well, I mean, I should, I should try to bridge the gap. And so originally the mission statement on the blog was something along the lines of to, to, my goal or my mission is to contribute to, you know, bridging the gap and creating more connection between the corners of the sport of show jumping through storytelling and through media coverage. And that was the intention of the blog from day one. So when did you decide that Noel Floyd will take a 19 degree turn to become not only a media uh, that shares about the equestrian sports, but a genuine empowering platform to help foster a new equestrian lifestyle? Oh, that's <laughs> quite a statement. Thank you. Um, I think it was an evolution. It wasn't like a 90 degree turn. It was, it's, a, it's, You know, I think the best advice, some of the best advice I've ever received in terms of the way you build your brand or the way you evolve a company is you crab walked your way there. So we crab walked our way there. We did a magazine. We had a creative agency. We tried and we explored different aspects, different ways in which we could have relationship with equestrians. Um, and we then in that process, we recognized that there was a huge opportunity in online education um, and we recognize that opportunity and we were really fortunate that we, we, we made that shift just before COVID for, before the pandemic. So that was like, you know, very fortuitous, but I think our relationship, I mean, the brand's relationship, both myself and my team, the relationship is very give and take, you know, you're asking questions and you're listening to the answer and then you're, you know, you're utilizing the fact that you're a startup and you're a smaller company, you're able to, you're nimble and you're, you're mobile and you're able to pivot quite easily. Um, the bigger you get as a business, it's harder for you to just to like put your ear to the ground and really listen to what people need and what they want. And then basically just give it to them. And, and that's the kind of, I think the evolution and I've asked questions Um, you know, I've offered things to the horse world and people have been like, no, we're good. Thanks. Like you don't, you're not going to get it right every time. But I think the importance is that it's that back and forth. It's that conversation. And that conversation happens in media. That conversation happens in business. That conversation happens on social media. Like it's a back and forth. I think it's important that we don't just have a one way form of communication in any, in any version of the Noel Floyd platform. You said earlier that your first wish was to have a mark on the industry and on sports. Do you mm -hmm. believe that you found a way to have your mark? I think I've found a version. I mean, I have so many more things I want to do. Um, and in some ways, I feel like I've only just, I'm only just getting started. But yeah, I think we've made a mark. I think... 
I'm really grateful that we are just able to be the, you know, it's just really about being in the right place at the right time and being a bit of a catalyst for, you know, again, it's like going back to the, what journalism is, you're just mirroring what is true and present. And I think that is what our job as a platform to do is to listen and to mirror and to empower um, the community in giving them the tools that they need. And in, in, and in our case, that really is education and storytelling. That is what, where we see our contributions to be. But I, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful that we've been given, we've had the opportunity and the timing and the support from the community to make a mark because it's a real privilege to be able to do that. And I think it's a, it's, and I, I look at it really as a responsibility. I have a resp- like, I feel sort of in service to the horse world. That's really what has like driven me for the last 10 years and will drive me for the next 10 years. You feel in service for the horse world. And um, I can only wonder if the horse world is also in service for you. And and here's a story I'd like to share to know if you can relate to that. Um, So this is a story of ours that I'd like to share. Um, We recorded a podcast episode with a French driver, uh, Benjamin Ayo, and we went to meet Benjamin at Bordeaux Driving World Cup um, during, you know, the five star uh, World Cup. Uh, mm-hmm. That mix, mixes show jumping and, and driving. And we stayed uh, late in the evening to record our conversation with Benjamin. We hardly know, known him before, and um, he raised various issues. And like how keeping horses in, in individual stalls is an absolute tragedy for their well being, how we ex- expect things from the horse we shouldn't expect. And um, Mm. I I can only remember it was the first year of the media and it was quite new for us. And uh, this felt like a earthquake, you know, in our mind. Um, Mm -hmm. After this day, we spent weeks trying to process the contradictory emotion he provoked in our Mm -hmm. minds. And um, I I know we felt terrible also for the way we were riding and, you know, conditioning the horse. Is this something that ever happened to you? And is this something also you want to reflect now in the new Noel Floyd platform? Oh, yeah. I mean, I've had existential crisis about horses for for the better part of my entire adulthood. I mean, I think if you're not questioning how you do things all the time, it's exhausting. Don't get me wrong, it's exhausting. And it can be, um, I mean, it's a very emotional thing to constantly question. I think I've actually started to sort of make peace with the fact that I question everything all the time. I really fought that part of my constitution in the beginning. And I think I was really blind in the beginning of my blog. If I'm honest, I think I was really like immune to just seeing things and experiencing forms of treatment that I was just, yeah, you're just immune to it. And it's not like you're, and I think there's a lot of people like that in, in the horse world, you know, you're, that you're, you're just immune to seeing things that um, if you were to go away for a while and then come back and see it with fresh eyes, you might be like, whoa, actually that makes me really uncomfortable. I think one of the things that is most exciting is that we're seeing a shift in the overall horse horse community, the equine community, around people not willing to be quiet about their uncomfortable feelings anymore. And I have been inspired by people, other people within this within the sport and within the space to help me and say, hey, I'm uncomfortable, or that makes me uncomfortable, or I don't agree with that. I think that, I mean, I have questioned every aspect of what we do with horses more than once. Um, and I think that's that I probably will do that for the rest of my life because we have this, you know, it's like, like it's, it's what I want to spend the rest of my life asking questions about is like, why do we do what we do? And, and how are we doing it the right way? And are we, are we honoring and respecting the relationship with the horse to the best of our ability? Are we truly doing that? Or are we pursuing, you know, fame and fortune? Or are we pursuing significance? Are we going to, I mean, the big question I've often asked myself is, will we 
will we ruin the essence of what the horse human relationship is for the pursuit of our own significance? And that is one of, I think the question that I will witness and watch myself ask myself for the rest of my life, because this is an evolution and it's not just me, it's everybody. And I think what's really beautiful is that you're seeing more conversation and you're seeing more responsibility being asked of everybody. So I really resonate with how you guys felt after that podcast recording, because I have felt that many times I've been at places and I've been like, what the hell is going on? Like, I just, I don't think you should let go of that feeling though. I would say that you grab hold of it. It's what keep, it's what makes you an aware person versus sedated versus blind versus someone with their blinkers on. And lots of people move through the world choosing not to look at what they don't want to look at because it, it helps them function. And I'm not here to judge them or tell them they should do differently. That's not my role. My role is to mirror back or to contribute in whatever way I can um, and empower people to be able to speak up and, and, and say what they are and are not comfortable with. And that I think is how I see my contribution and, and the way in which I manage my uncomfortable feelings about things that I've seen in the past, things that I see in that are happening today. Um, I think the important thing is, first of all, as you're, as an individual to not look away. If you have the strength of character to see what you are like, to really see what you are seeing and not pretend that it doesn't exist and not pretend that pain signals in horses don't exist, to not pretend that, you know, the archaic forms of training that have been sort of accepted in the past are now being brought to the forefront and are saying this is not acceptable anymore. And I think it's really about the individual being empowered to be able to see and speak, because if the individual can see and speak, then that builds a wave of momentum and that momentum cannot be ignored by the governing bodies that will able that are able to actually change and create systemic like systemic change there is this huge topic we talked about with michel asray who is the inventing french team director and the question was who is responsible for trying to reduce the number of accidents in this sport? How should we act to make this sport safer? How should we rely when it's time to take decisions? And Michel told us this is everyone's responsibility. Everyone is responsible of picking the right horse, riding the right class, not climbing too fast the categories later. Is the same question for equestrian welfare. Are we as individuals, as horse owners, as riders, responsible for the future of our sport? Absolutely. Absolutely. The individual is more responsible. We all are, we all contribute to social equity. You cannot point a finger and defer to somebody else. If you see something that you don't like, then speak up and say something. That's why social media has been, in a lot of ways, you know, it's a double-edged sword. It has, it's a coin with two sides to it. One of the positive parts is that it is elevating the level of self-responsibility that everyone has because everyone has a camera. So if you're doing something that shouldn't, you shouldn't be doing and someone records you and films you doing that, then who's, you know, it's, you have, you are um, held accountable for your behavior. I think that if we are expecting for people to be held individually accountable for their behavior, then we have to empower the individual to contribute to the social equity of the horse world or the horse sport, horse welfare, all of it. Okay. Another story that's, um, <laughs> That was kind of hard, I have to say. Um, and that kept me thinking all over since this day. Um, so I went to Falsabo Host Show. Have you ever been? Yes. No. Have you been? No, no I haven't been to Falsabo. No, I've been to Gothenburg. I've not been to Falsabo. Okay. So there is something very famous in Falsabo, and this is the rabbit races. I don't know if you ever heard about that. Rab like rabbits? Like bunnies? Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, no, I've never seen so that. So they're jumping. So, well, I oh. just tagged Falsabo, you know, on my socials, and then I received a couple of messages. Go see the jumping rabbit. This is the funniest thing on earth. And so, so I did. I did um, go to see this very, very popular discipline. This is huge thing huge thing in Fastabo. Loads of people of people watching and there is even the final, you know, in the main arena. Um, so I went there and uh, this is my version. The rabbits look miserable to me. A hundred percent of them hit the poles, crashed on obstacles. The obstacles seemed very high to me. The rabbits mm, stopped, refused to keep going. You know, they would be kicked in the, in the ass to be encouraged to keep going and so on. And um, at first I was horrified. And then I realized that non-equestrians must see all sport the same way. And um, I talked with a French show jumping rider riding the, the World Cup, the Nations Cup. And we were thinking that, okay, non equestrian would see us kicking in, you know, the belly of the horse to kick th to keep them going and having horses pull, um, pull the poles and crash in the oxers. Mm -hmm. And do you think that we, <laughs> we were thinking like that? Well, unfortunately, I think with the way that movies and cinema have represented horses in film, I think people think it's acceptable to kick a horse, you know, often in like Western films, you know, it's like, you know, people literally, I've <laughs> like, you see it in movies even now. And I think, again, this comes back to our responsibility of how we are represented across all forms um, of sports coverage to media coverage to film. I would love to see people evolve the way that, like, allowing the general everyday human being to witness what a horse and a human, what a horse human relationship looks like under saddle. And not having the kicking, not having the spurs, not having the big Western bits, not having the, like, you know, the, the, the kind of big active body language. Um, I think it starts there. Like, I think the way that we are represented everywhere is really important for us to look at and for directors and, and for like, for people. And again, it comes back to, you know, the individual being able to speak up and say like, that's not, you know, that's not an accurate representation of how you would ask a horse to canter off into the sunset. Right. Um, so I think that people do, Unfortunately, because of the way that horses have been represented in film, I think that people do think that that's like they can think that that's acceptable, that they kick them with the spur, or that they jump up or they rear up and they're like, oh, that's fun. You know, um, I think that there are people also and I've, I've mean, I've had conversations with people who who watch it and they're like, what's going on? Like, this is bizarre. Um, I think that the. I think that the world at large and like humans, like the society outside of the horse world are really drawn to horses. And I see that I see evidence of this all the time. And so as the horse as like the, as horse media or horse sport or horse, um, horse shows, whatever coverage, it's our job to just be able to show them the magic of what horses are because that's what that's what the public is really interested in. That's you know that's what horses like Vallegro um, and Secretariat and Sea Biscuit. That's what that's why like the the larger population is drawn to them because of their spirit, because of the magnificence of who they are. They're not drawn to the rider; they're drawn to the horse. That's what our that's what it like. That's the key to our significance, and I think we forget that. I think we love to like you know, talk about these riders and we love to pull big names and famous names. And we like to, that sort of what I call the cheap thrills of like drawing attention to sort of a big high profile, um, rider. And I don't think that that's in the best interest long-term, um, on how people see and perceive what we do with horses, because at the essence of it is really beautiful. The relationship between horses and humans is really, really beautiful. If you could argue it's one of the purest things that exist in an interspecies relationships. And then our ego gets involved. 
our, you know, our concern for significance gets involved, our competitive nature gets involved, business gets involved, money gets involved. And then, you know, it starts to pile on top of it. Um, and it's harder for the public to see what we see, what we experience every day with horses, right? And so it's really, I think, about decluttering all the bullshit, <laughs> if I'm honest, and just getting to the core of what it is, which is the spirit of horses and their willingness to do all these amazing things with us as, as people, as humans. That's the essence of everything that we spend our entire life and our entire, you know, waking hours trying to understand, trying to represent, trying to storytell around, trying to film around, trying to write about. That's what it's about, is that this, this is amazing moment in history when horses were domesticated by people and they're and then they were they we have evolved as two species together in this very unique relationship that is thousands of years old and that to me is what i hope that we don't lose sight of is that in its purest form it is enough it doesn't need to be made more than that I'm not sure we have ever named it in this podcast, and yet this is quite central when thinking of the future of all sports. Could you define, because I know that you talk about it a lot, could you define the concept of social license and share you, your view about that? Do you think that horseback riding social license is under a threat and um, that we could not be able slash allow to ride and compete with horses in the future? I don't think that's for me to say if I think that's up to I think that's in the future and that is fated you know whether that comes to pass so social license will be the, the public allowing us or finding it acceptable for riders to yeah, ride and compete for sure process. yeah I mean I think that I absolutely think there's always a chance that that society will decide, you know what, we just don't really um, understand what you're trying to do. But it will be a slow, if it goes that way, which it very likely could, and it just really comes down to what we're doing and whether we're, we're as a collective willing to be proactive um, in the shifts and the changes that we can make. And we can make them. That's the thing is that, um, and it's just about a decision about whether we make them or whether we react to Um, our lack of social license. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that it will be, if, if we go down that route, it will be slow. First, we'll lose our position in the Olympics. Then there will be less. Um, but I don't think we lose social license in the relationship between horses and humans. I think that it's just, we could lose social license when it comes to sports. And the way, and I would, and I really must distinguish this, it's the way that the sport is represented and the way that it's formatted right now, right? And so for the larger percentage of people who ride horses, their social license isn't going away because they'll just change and evolve the way that they relate to their individual horse. You know, a lot of people, it's just them and their horse or a couple horses in their field. They might ride them in the trails or they might go to a local horse show. Their, their, um, their relationship with their horses isn't changing because it's not um, at, the, at the high profile that exists in the high performance side of things. And I think it's the job of high performance and I think it's the job of the Olympic disciplines and I think it's the job of the what I would call the sort of professional sport aspects of things. It's their job to be proactive, to determine whether they truly are current in the representation of the relationship between the horse and the rider. And that's what it comes down to is sport is a re representation of the relationship between horse and rider. And it's sport is just a way in which we participate and the way in which we um, explore and, ex and, and express that relationship. But there's millions of people 
20 million to be exact, that ride, they're not representative of the high performance. They're not going to go to the Olympics. So whether we have a sport in the Olympics or not, does it, is it going to affect the individual's experience? No. It will affect the significance of high performance and of, of the sport of the representatives and the, and, but it won't be overnight. That would be my, that would be my position in this current moment. And that might change. Um, but it wouldn't be overnight, but I've told many of my friends who compete in the high performance side of things in Europe, and they get annoyed about PETA, you know, protesting at the Europeans I'm like, don't think that's going away anytime soon. In fact, it's just going to get louder because if you don't listen or you don't, you don't recognize that they are there for a reason. I think one of our biggest mistakes is to think that people are deluded. You know, I think people give them more credit than that and at least have a conversation with them. But if you pretend that they don't exist, they won't go away. And do you think the federations, uh, international or national, has this biggest role uh, to play in this process to uh, ensure that riders respect their horses, to talk with these animalist associations, to listen, to have a discussion with, with them? And do you think it's up to the federations to work on that process? I think that you're going to see the, the development and the, the creation of third party organizations because they don't feel confidence in the federations that exist now. And unless federations elect representatives that are truly representative of the body of the horse world, and that doesn't mean putting photos of people riding Liberty on their Instagram account. That means like actually having people um, in positions of power and influence who represent like the larger interests. So people who are, you know, and we are seeing a lot of interest in natural horsemanship. We're seeing a lot of interest in um, like pressure free or not pressure free because that's a, that's a, that's a rabbit hole in itself. But like um, milder forms of riding, let's say. Um, I think if I think it's important that the federations have people that exist within them that is truly representative. And I'll give you a story that I'll, I'll use an example here. I went to an FEI sport forum years and years and years ago. And I was really concerned by the fact that not only was I the youngest, I was invited there to audit, like to listen to the discussion. So I went to Lausanne, Switzerland, and I stood out like a sore thumb because I had like my hoodie and my leather jacket, my backpack, my laptop, my headphones, you know, a classic sort of tech blogger like you know um and everyone else in the room was older than me by at least 15 20 years everyone else was wearing suits everyone else was very formal there was i was happy to see there was you know a good representation of men and women but i was concerned for the lack of younger voices in the room if i'm completely honest and that would be my example that I would reference in my own experience of like when I sat there and I thought, well, there's no one in this room like me. And there's a lot of me's out there, but there's no one in this room in Switzerland, in this, in this Lucent, in this amazing, you know, very fancy, big, like lecture hall with hundreds of people there. And I looked around and there's no one around like me. And I thought, well, that's odd because there's a lot of me's out there, millions to be frank. And why don't they exist in the general discussion of the future of equestrianism in, as a whole? So I do think that the federations, to, to, I mean, it's a very long answer to your simple question, but um, it's a complicated one because I'm not sure if people are confident And again, it's not my opinion. It's, it's really just a reflection of what I see and what I hear is that I don't think people are actually confident in the Federation's ability to be proactive 
versus reactive. And so what is going to happen? You're going to have groups, non-for-profit groups, um, advocacy groups formed proactively to make noise so that the federations will react. And that is that cause and effect relationship that I think is really important that a sport gets out of or um, in our case, I mean, we're an industry. We're both a sport and we're, we're both a sport and not a sport. You know, that's what's unique about us. That's why we're not Formula One, because a lot of people don't sort of like casually drive Formula One. You're either a professional and you watch it, you know, whereas we're like a small percentage of people do high performance and who are represented in this kind of global um, sport community. And then there's the rest of us who are amateur riders who have a horse who want to just go trail riding or maybe compete at their local horse show or go to a clinic or, you know, and so I think it's important that that the majority actually has a significant voice. And I don't know where the majority can go to actually be heard besides going on social media. Definitely. So after years and years of interviewing equestrian, of traveling to shows, to bars, of being immersed in the equestrian world, how has your passion evolved? Have you ever gotten fed of this world? No, no. no? I'll never, ever get tired of the okay. horse world, ever. No, I mean, I think it helped also that I took a bit of a break and I explored other other sports personally because I will always be in the horse world like in that way. Um, but no, I think that what I love about the horse world is that you can evolve and change so much. You're not pegged as one thing, you know, like I'm exploring Western riding now I'm exploring Liberty. I'm exploring like bridleless and saddleless riding. I mean, it's so amazing. And what's in true of the horse human connection is that you will spend the rest of your life learning about it. And so you just, if you are, uh, you know, if, if I think that's what's, it's a real gift. You're never going to perfect it. And any person, Olympian or, you know, child rider will tell you, you're never, ever going to perfect your horsemanship. You're never, ever going to perfect your ability in the saddle. And that's, it's a lifelong pursuit. So yeah, no, I'll never get tired of it. And so you have met an infinite list of horse people. Who are the person whom you most admired? Oh, Only one. <laughs> It's hard. Only one? <laughs> yeah, <Maybe>. only one. <laughs> oh my gosh. There's like no way that I can answer that. There's no way that I can answer that. <laughs> no, like, I mean, oh, God. Um, okay, I will, I will say one person because they reflect, they represent the sort of, like, what I want to, I think the emotion that I want to express, which is I really admire... Warwick Schiller, because he has documented his personal growth journey and helped his audience understand how that exists alongside his horsemanship. And he's really highlighted that it, at the end of the day, a lot of the challenges that we have have nothing to do with our horses and everything to do with ourselves and everything to do with our own relationship with ourselves. And he's really drawn an attention to the fact that I think if you want to really evolve as a horse person, that you have to do a lot of work on yourself and you have to do a lot of personal growth work and you have to be aware of your shadows and your ego and your triggers and the way you relate and your attachment and all the things that are very available, more available than ever. And so I would say that at the moment, and this, I mean, that answer changes every year, but at the moment, I would say Warwick is creating a conversation that every single person in the horse world should listen to, which is understanding how your human experience fundamentally affects every aspect of your horsemanship. And if you think that that is not true, then you're 10 years behind. 
So maybe the answer will be the same, but if there are any US or Canadian horseman, horsewoman that we should absolutely interview? Oh, Warwick Schiller for sure. I think Tick Maynard is amazing. He's also someone who's, he, Tick, Tick Maynard is incredible because he bridges the gap between sport and natural horsemanship. Um, so Tick is absolutely should be on your list. Um, I think if you want someone to speak to the spiritual, the, like the somatic ability that, um, horses bring to our lives and like, is able to actually explain what it is that how horses affect us, like, um, somatically, I would talk to Dewey Freeman. Um, I think who else? I think, um, I also think Claire is a fascinating person that I'm just diving into. And Linda Kovanoff, who wrote, I've just, I've been reading her books and she's like amazing. Um, I think they are people who really need to have a voice at the moment because I think that the horse world is, is craving an understanding of the spiritual experience that exists between horses and humans and to make it so that it's not, you know, like, I think we need to embrace the fact that that is a component that we all experience and that it's not this woo woo hippie nonsense that it's actually and like Dewey Freeman can speak to this because he's a clinical psychologist and he has, um, thousands and thousands of hours working in equine therapy. He can, actually scientifically explain to you what happens between horses and humans. And I think that applies. And if, if people in the horse, in the sports space think that that doesn't involve them, then I think they're, that's, again, that's the blinkers that we spoke about, right? That's to believe that you are separate to this deep connection that exists between horses and humans, I think is, is you're deluded to think that you can have a transactional relationship with the horse. A horse is too powerful. Like, I think their emotional presence is too powerful them, for them not to have an effect on people around them. And I think a lot of the time, and I'll leave you with this, is like, I think horse people are actually more aware of that than ever. And I think in order to function sometimes in the systems that we do, we actually almost consciously choose to numb ourselves from that because it will make what we're doing easier. And so the invitation, it's like, so for everyone who's listening, my invitation is like, what would it be like if you said the weird thing? Or if you said the thing that you're so terrified of saying, what would it, what would it feel like if you actually just were to say it out loud at first to just empower yourself, to have the full experience of what it is to be in the presence of horses, what it is to be just in their presence, let alone being able to choose to, ha to have a life with them. What would it be like if you actually opened yourself up, your, you opened your heart up to that possibility? And I think if more and more people individually do that in the horse world, then, then changes and shifts will happen that we can't even foretell. And that's what's exciting, is that we actually can't look into the future because we don't know the impact that the individual has on the collective future of horse of horses and humans, both in sport and not. So, yeah. That's a, that the best way to end up our conversation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noel. Um, maybe we could, entitle the podcast the episode don't be or dare dare not to be a blanker yeah yeah take your blinders off or something like that absolutely i think that's a great title all right thank you noel thank you very much yeah thanks so much guys have a good one